So, Dr. Priolo, uh, a question has been submitted that throughout all, all Scripture would be helpful for this. Is there a certain book of the Bible you would recommend reading to help grow our fear of God over fear of man? Um, before I answer that, well, let me give the answer first, and then I want to unpack something else. Uh, probably um, the book of Psalms in the Old Testament and maybe the book of Hebrews in the, in the New Testament we talked about fear. What we didn't talk much about is, is worry. So um, I make a distinction between worry or anxiety and fear because there are particular passages in the Bible that would be more, although they would all be connected, there are certain passages that would be more apropos for worry and certain for fear. Now, what's the difference between worry and fear? Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for things of itself. <clears throat> Every day has, has enough, enough trouble of its own. Fear is something that kind of grips you in the present tense and paralyzes you and keeps you from fulfilling your responsibility. Worry, anxiety, is, has to do with uh, uh, the future. I am distracted by all the things that might go wrong tomorrow, next week, next year. And so when, when I, I'm counseling people and they often say they have fear, I try to ask them some questions. Okay, is it really fear that, that's locking you down and keep you from fulfilling your responsibilities? I said, no, I'm fulfilling my responsibilities, but the fact of the matter is I'm distracted two and a half hours a day because I'm constantly preoccupied with all the things that could go wrong in the future. So there is one treatment, there's one biblical you know, set of biblical resources to deal with anxiety. And although they're related, another one for fear. So if it's an anxiety thing, then Philippians 4, 6 through 9, Matthew chapter, um, Matthew chapter 6, 7. Yeah, helpful. And this builds off of what you just talked about previously. You know, when it comes to the aspect of man-pleasing or people-pleasing, it's one thing to put those things off. But if you really cultivate this fear of God, it's going to melt away mm -hmm. any fear that remains for other people in this life. And I didn't mention this far because, you know, obviously my whatever happened to me, happened to me. But um, um, it has to do with making decisions. You want to learn how in every decision to make, to ask yourself, will this decision please God? If you can learn how to finalize decisions based more on God's will, what will please God, than on what man thinks it will revolutionize everything. We all make lots of little decisions every day. And if we're God pleasers, when we make a decision, we're thinking, what does scripture say? What does the Bible say? Any examples in the Bible that I can follow here? Any principles I need to consider? Any directives I need? As opposed to a person who's a people pleaser, it's like, uh-oh, like, well, what's going to make me look good? Or, or how can I protect myself from being embarrassed? Or what's so-and-so going to think? So it really is a matter of learning how in your decision-making uh, processes to <clears throat> consider what the Bible says about the decision you have to make, big decisions or small decisions. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, a couple of questions have been submitted on, you know, those some people might have an understanding of some of these principles or know much about the Bible, but they're still being gripped by this fear how would you seek to help these individuals who know of God's Word or certain principles but are struggling to actually apply it to the seizing fear that they're experiencing in their life? Again, <clears throat> I'd like to know if it's, if, it's, if it's fear or if it's anxiety. So let me, let me do the anxiety first, the, the worry about what could go wrong in the future. When you're a worrier, and to a certain extent, when you're a people, uh, I'm sorry, when you're fearful, um, it becomes very hard to grasp uh, the truth. So it's like the truth is there and you, you try to grasp it and you just can't get a hold of it. And so um, as a counselor, you kind of have to take the person's hand and just help them grab it and hold on to it until it becomes a part of them. I went through a pretty uh, significant period of my life where I really struggled with worry. And I would say to my wife, honey, help me to figure out what I'm thinking here. She said, Lou, you're the counselor, what do you need? 
And then she would say, like, I told you over and over, I know, but, I, but you need to tell me again. Just tell me the same thing again. For whatever reason, it's hard when you're in worry mode. Let me tell you what worry mode is. Um, so, you know, you, you're looking at something, and before too long, you, you figure out uh, how to worry about it. And you kind of obsess over it for a while, and then you say, I can't do that. And you, start, and you think about biblically and how to get it. It's like, okay, I got it. And then you're rocking along, and then all of a sudden, you'll focus on something else. And if you're not careful, you figure out how to worry about that. And then you, and, and it's almost like for a period of hours or days, no matter what you look at, you're going to figure out how to worry. So I would just tell myself, blue, you're in worry mode. Don't trust your own thoughts. You know, it'll be over in a few days. Just, be, just do what the Bible says. Be suspicious of your own thoughts. Trust the thoughts of the people around you. Marinate yourself in God's word. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, these are stubborn sins. And they, they you know, I can't like take these two scripture verses and call me in the morning. I mean, these things have to be worked into, into your life. For those who worry, I, I recommended to someone yesterday, if you go to my website, it's called competenttocounsel.com. Uh, .org, .net, .com, competent to counsel, .whatever. Uh, it's called Competent to Counsel International, and there's a really cool video on there that I did for helping people overcome worry. That, and in that video, I talk about something called an anxiety journal. Again, I didn't have time to cover it. That was not one of the topics that I was asked to speak on. But that resource, that video, and the explanation of how to use an anxiety journal has helped more people in, in our church even. I mean, you know, we just had an anxiety workshop in our, for the women in our church and my assistant went through the anxiety journal and it was like, whoa, I've never seen anything like this. So there are practical resources out there. There are more books that I can recommend. There's a good book for women by Elise Fitzpatrick called Overcoming Fear, Anxiety, and Worry. My favorite book is John MacArthur's book, um, Anxious for Nothing. Wayne Mack has a really good book called Down But Not Out. The thing I like about this book is it's divided in three sections. The first section, the first three chapters deal with anxiety. And, you know, Wayne is very tedious and very, uh, very, I mean, he covers everything. And then the middle section of the book is on burnout. And then the last section of the book is on what I call the attending sins of worry, right? Things like discontentment, self-pity, discouragement, you know. And so it covers not only the, the issue of anxiety, but it covers the, the, the sins that kind of lock arms with anxiety and march into your life at the same time or shortly thereafter if you don't get the anxiety under control. He and Josh wrote a book on courage. There, uh, there's, you know, as I said, there's um, Jerry Bridges' book. There's so many resources. We have more resources in the biblical counseling movement on fear and anxiety than probably any other single topic. So again, it's just a matter of marinating your mind with the truth of God's word, having someone com completely, uh, I'm sorry, um, consistently remind you of the truth of God's word, and don't be discouraged. Uh, this type sometimes comes out only by prayer and fasting. It's not a quick fix, but it is something that the Bible addresses. They are fundamentally sins, and you can learn how to get your fear under control, and you can learn how to to displace the fear <clears throat> of man with the fear of God, and you can learn how to get to the point where you're controlling the fear. The fear is not controlling you. You are slaying the fear monster. It's not, it, it, it's not controlling you. Now, you may have a moment here, a moment there, but then you pull out the biblical resources. Bottom line is, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you do not faint. Now, the number one catalyst, the number one atomic bomb is scripture memorization and meditation. There is nothing that's going to work. It. When you read scripture, okay, it has an impact on your life, but it's kind of transient. When you memorize scripture, okay, it becomes a part of you. So last night we went out for dinner and I had this um, skirt steak with, um, with chimichanga sauce on it. It was really good, right? Well, guess what? Today that is part of me. Well, you read scripture, it has some residual effects, and I don't want to minimize it because the word of God is the word of God, and, it, and God uses it in our lives. But when you internalize God's word and memorize and meditate on those passages of scripture, it becomes a part of your soul, and it changes things more quickly, more dramatically than even reading the scripture. I don't want to minimize reading and listening to the, um, listening to podcasts, listening to scripture. All of that is great, and it will help. 
But if you want the magic bullet, if you want the big catalyst, find those passages that take the spiritual tranquilizer. I mean, that's the bottom line. Find those passages that particularly deal with you, memorize them, meditate on them, and you'll be surprised at how, how um, amazing the tranquilizing effect of God's word is on your mind and heart. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. I think of Psalm 1, the imagery that the psalmist gives there of the one who's planted by the streams of water is the one who flourishes. So often... The issue there is day and night. Yeah. Right. It is law he meditates day and night, as opposed to worrying day and night. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Exactly. And so, you know, we get questions of like, you know, I'm reading my <clears throat> Bible, but I'm not really either getting something out of it or I don't see the change happening. And I think it goes right along with what you're saying. Okay. You know, it's not just the, the command is not to read richly, it's to dwell richly, dwell richly in the Scriptures. And let me address that from another angle. Somebody said there's three stages of Bible reading, three phases. The medicine stage, you take it because it's good for you. The cereal stage, it's dry but nourishing. And the dessert stage, you can't get enough of it. Well, you can be on the dessert stage one day and the next day be back in the medicine stage. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean it's not working. Just because you don't get a warm fuzzy, just because your quiet time this morning was not half as thrilling and exciting and ooh as it was the day before, doesn't mean the word of God is not working. Right? Did, you ever, did you ever look at your hand and you say, I got a paper cut? What? When did that happen? Oh yeah, I, get, I was handling papers about 12 minutes ago. I guess I must have come. You didn't feel it, right? If Zach and I were, were, were doing you know, I took a swipe at his neck, and he says, you miss me? And I say, oh, no, I didn't try to, sh try to wiggle your head. I mean, just because you didn't feel it doesn't mean it, do it, it didn't work. The Word of God is alive, and it's powerful, right? And it will impact you. If you're a Christian, it will impact you whether you feel it or not. And it will have a sanctifying, cleansing effect whether or not you feel it. And if you do it consistently, yeah, in time you should see some, some progress. But don't get discouraged by the fact that, you know, your devotions, your quiet time, your Bible reading today was not as, as fun or easy or thrilling as it was last, you know, last week or even yesterday. Helpful. Very practical as well. <clears throat> Getting a little more specifically, got a question that's come in on how do I overcome the fear of not knowing my children's eternal destiny? Mm. Yeah, that, that is a very, that is a, a very um, difficult burden to bear. But again, I think you have to um, rest in God's sovereignty, in his goodness. You know, if you were a faithful parent and you brought your children up in the discipline and instruction in the Lord, you have to kind of cling to God's promises that his word will not return void. If, uh, if you became a Christian later in life and you, you, know, you never really taught the scriptures to your children, then uh, you have to pray for them and um, again, cling to the promises of God. The, the thing that um, most people don't realize is we are going to worry about the things that we love the most. So people come into our office and often they'll be worried about their salvation. Am I really a Christian? Well, they're going to worry about that because that's the most important thing to them. They're going to worry about the safety of their family because they love those things the most. And so I, I typically try to give them some help with the specifics like assurance of salvation. But the moment I find out they're worriers, I kind of say, look, I'll help you with that, but we're going to put that in the back burner. Or we're not going to focus on that, at least. <clears throat> You've got a word problem, right? Yeah. Then let's just help you learn how to deal with your chronic anxiety, your sinful fear and worry. And let's just see, because if history teaches me anything, it teaches me that as you learn how to deal with your anxious spirit overall, generally speaking, you're going to worry less about your eternal state. You're going to worry less about your children. Fundamentally, let's not put the cart before the horse. Let's deal with the, the sin habit pattern of worry and fear 
And as you deal with that, you learn in the process how to deal with the particulars about your eternal security of your family. But over time, as you learn how to be a, a, um, <clears throat> a God-trusting person rather than an anxious person, all of these fears should start to dissipate and ultimately, uh, hopefully, diminish. Helpful. Understanding how you view God will then result in how you view the situations in our lives, especially good desires for the salvation of children and eternal destiny of that. Questions come in um, about a comment you made last night, uh, phrasing, insanity is not interpreting life through the lens of Scripture. Question is, does that mean biblical counseling does not recognize mental illness? No, of course not. I mean, the, the difficulty is, of course, we, I mean, if, if, Zach's, <clears throat> if, if Zach creeped up behind me and hit me over the head with a sledgehammer and my brains would be screaming, I had a real mental illness, right? But of course there's such a thing as mental illness. The thing is, we have a lot of things called today called mental illness, and we don't really know if there's, a, if there's an organic ideation to them. And so, you know, we leave a crack of the fact that, yeah, this may really be an organic medical problem. But in the meantime, we don't know. And even if it is, even if someday it's proven, or even if we know today there is an organic factor to it, you know, what, when you're, when you're physically sick, you don't need counsel? You don't need how to learn how to handle your sickness? So the issue is not that we, we would deny mental illness. It's just in our day, you know, many, many things that used to be called sin are now, becoming, are be, now being identified as mental illness. And know there may be genetic factors. There may be organic factors. If God calls something a sin, even though we may be having, we may have help from our genes or help from our genetics or help <clears throat> from other biological factors, we have to look at it primarily as a sin and treat it primarily as a sin, even though we know that, that genetically or biologically, it may be easier for us to sin or fall into this temptation than the next person. So no, the issue is not that we don't believe in mental illness. The issue is, um, in some cases, we don't understand and the, the science is either not there or it's fuzzy. I mean, look at the, look at the latest thing with Prozac. Are you all up on that? Like, we've been preaching for years, right? Antidepressants don't really uh, work the way they work, uh, according to. And again, the research has been there all along, but now it just came out that you know the 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 sixty percent of people that are helped by antidepressants uh, are helped not because of a serotonin deficiency, but there's some other mechanism that we don't know why, but seems to help those small percentage of people. But again, we just wait for the science to verify it. If the science is fuzzy or the science is not there, we leave a crack in the door that someday there may be a, an organic factor, an organic, you know, something discovered that demonstrates it really is an organic thing. But in the meantime, you know, you go to a doctor to help you with the organic thing and we'll help you with the spiritual thing. So we kind of play both ends against the middle. But no, of course, we, we believe in, you know, organic mental illness. I think that's what's really helpful to reemphasize, right? We're not medical doctors if you come to the counseling room or visit us in the office. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm not a medical doctor, right? So you need to see a medical physician to, to understand that. But for every issue in life, there's also a spiritual response to that. And so that's what we want to emphasize because that's where we can help you through the scriptures to go. It's not just an either or, but sometimes it's a both and. And again, sooner or later, science catches up with the Bible. It mm -hmm. always happens. So here's, a, here's another situation where, you know, biblical counselors were not anti-antidepressants, but we were saying, look, you know, let the doctors help you with that, but there are spiritual issues here that, um, that are causing or exa exacerbating, if not causing. Your, and, and, what, and what, let's take depression, okay? So what are the... What are the three most common causes of depression? Okay, it's anxiety, it's guilt, um, it's uh, grief, and it's bitterness. Now there are others, but a person comes in and I'm talking to them and in the first hour, you know, we've got two of the three. And I said, look, I'm not a doctor. I don't know whether or not, you know, that there's an organic thing here, but you know, you told me about these two things that are going on in your life. I would be depressed if I had those things going on in your life. So let's find a doctor who will do real blood work and who will you know, analyze things under microscopes and do the lab work and find out if there's like an issue 
like thyroid problems or other things that you know have as a side effect depression. So you go to Dr. Jones, and meantime, let me help you deal with this, th these non-organic causes of depression, and we'll play both ends against the middle. So we're absolutely not. I mean, it's many of our, a good number of our members are medical doctors. So we're not anti-medicine or anti-medication. Another question's come in of, uh, what do you say to someone who says they're disappointed in God, not because they didn't get what they wanted, but because they've been hurt by others? Um, they're going to have, well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to come across like uncompassionate. I would need to ask a lot of questions to get to the root of it. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> I'd have to ask them, okay, you've been hurt by other people. Um, have you forgiven the people that have hurt you? Have you processed it biblically? Have you confronted the people that need, needed to be confronted? Have you responded to the hurt and rejection uh, biblically? And then once we've worked through that, okay, is God sovereign over that? Could God have stopped that? Yes. Did he stop it? No. Well, does that mean he had a purpose for it? Yes. Well, do you know, have you thought about what that purpose could be? Well, a little bit well, maybe we should spend some time trying to figure out what God might have been up to in allowing that to happen for you. Could be that he's testing your faith. It could be that he's building your character. It could be a Second Corinthians 1 thing. Blessed be the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, assistance, who assists us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to assist those. Maybe he allowed us to go through this so down the road, be, be able to have a ministry to other people. There could be lots of reasons why. But I'd, I'd find, I, I try to get them to make sure that they're responding biblically to the rejection and the hurt that they've dealt with it biblically, and then help them to um, make sure that they're not really bitter at God who could have prevented it, but for his purposes didn't. There's a, I mean, I could say a whole lot more about that, but I would need to get into the weeds and, you know, get, have more information about the kinds of hurt that the person experienced and how they responded to the hurt. If they responded sinfully, you know, that could be a thing. You know, somebody, somebody sins against you, so you retaliate and sinful, respond sinfully back. Well, that's going to complicate things. You know, that's going to affect your, your, the way you view God because even though he sinned against you, you've retaliated and you've not gone back and made it right. And so your guilty conscience is affecting the way you view God. I mean, there's so many, so many things that could um, factor into that that it's hard to give a cookie-cutter type of answer. Sure, and that's a helpful response to that. Um, it even seems like it fits in the category of what you've described already as not doubting God's control or sovereignty, but his goodness mm -hmm. in that category as well. Right. Uh, question just and, came. And, and again, yeah. you know, I, I want to, you know, I gave you a very, a very uh, academic answer. I mean, you have to have compassion on people who've been hurt. So it's not like you just say, well, you know, if you just get thinking together, you wouldn't be feel so bad. I mean, you have to have compassion on people who have been uh, hurt. So again, it's, it's kind of complicated. Question just came in just right now. Could you discuss the contrast between Christian psychology practices of teaching the counselee to dig up the past to understand it versus biblical counseling emphasizing looking at the past to see the faithfulness of God to build our faith and apply it to our current circumstances? Yeah, I think I understand the question. <clears throat> so if you go to, uh, depending on the school, I mean, there are like, so, okay. So when you talk about secular psychology, I mean, there are 400 different theories of counseling in the United States. So when people say, well, psychologists say, they don't know, if anybody says that to you, they don't know what they're talking about. You walk into a psychiatrist, you walk into a counselor's office, and you look at all these books. Oh, wow, this Freud over there, Skinner over there, also there, Young over here, Dr. Laura, Dr. Phil, you know, and you're thinking, oh, this guy really wrote all these books, he's really, really smart. What you don't know is that this author hates this author, this author thinks this author's a heretic. There's no consensus. They don't agree with each other. And so when you say, you know, psychologists, like, as, though, as though all psychologists and all psychiatrists, psychiatrists and psychologists, like all psychologists are on the same page. They're not. You can hardly get four, four cognitive behavioral psychologists to agree on everything, let alone a Freudian and a Jungian and a Canarian and a reality therapist guy psychodrama, gestalt. I mean, there are all of these different things. There's no consensus among any of them. 
So, you know, you've got to realize that when people say the way psychologists do things, well, psychologists do things a lot in a lot of different ways. They don't agree. You go to one, you go to one secular psychologist, he says, this is the, your problem. He, gives it, he, he, gives, he, he diagnoses according to his pet theory. You go to another psychologist, takes the same thing, he's got a different name for it. So you go to five different, like, you got one problem, you go to five different counselors, they all have different names for it, and you think you have five problems. Well, that's not necessarily uh, the case. Um, so the question is, so the Freudians are going to be, and, and there's certain of the theories are going to go backwards before you go forwards. So in biblical counseling, um, we do place a value on getting historical data because historical data can be helpful. So we're not against uh, going backwards and and trying to figure out the things that may have contributed to a person's thought pattern. But we don't have to spend two years in psychoanalysis going backwards, figuring out why a person's messed up. And we know why a person's messed up. We're messed up because we're born sinners. We're messed up because we learn things largely from our parents. We have not been redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold from the worthless behavior that we have received by tradition from our fathers. So we kind of have a head start. Does that mean we ignore the past? No. But, but what's most important is not so much that we figure out how we got messed up, because we kind of know, although the details may be helpful if we discover them as we go. But we can start in the present. What's most important, we figure out that the Bible says we are messed up, where we're messed up, right? In biblical terms, not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Spirit teaches. And then we begin to do what the Bible says we need to do to fix the problem, to deal with the problem. And as we're doing that, yes, if we get some insight from the past, you know, that may help us, then great, that's wonderful. And again, we do start out asking for historical data, but we don't have to spend two years trying to figure out why we're messed up. And then if you're a Freudian, you know, you have to be in counseling for the rest of your life. Really? Did that answer the question? They just wanted you to discuss further, and I, th I think that qualifies for that. Okay, okay. And I'm sure you can keep going on that. Maybe. One final question will be done. It's a hard one. It's not from the church. It's from me on behalf of our church. How could we be praying for you and your ministry in Atlanta at your church? Oh, thank you. Um, I guess for me, it's a matter of, uh, of priorities. Um, just, you know, I've got, I've got uh, the church is exploding. I've got, we, we hired two interns. We, we're trying to add staff. Um, my job is going to have to go uh, in the, in the I guess, years ahead from um, heavy on the counseling to doing more administration and over supervision of the other counselors. And so it's like, you know, I'll be doing the 300 and 400 level cases, and I've got other people now who can do the 1 and 200 level cases. So that's going to be a transition. Uh, I've got a list of over 100 books that need to be written. I'm not going to live long enough to write all the books, so I'm, but I really want to get some more books out. Um, and um, in my family <clears throat> situation, we've got some decisions uh, to make just in terms of the future. I, uh, I've become an Italian citizen. I don't know when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. My desire <coughs> is to, at some point in the next few years, move to Italy and start ministering, uh, strengthening the pastors in Italy to teach them how to do biblical counseling. And if I'm, in, if I'm in Italy, you know, I'm in Europe, so I could, you know, bleed over into some of the other. So that's kind of, that's kind of the long-term um, uh, plan and just pray for God's wisdom and guidance and direction. Thank you. Appreciate that. Can we show our appreciation to Dr. Lou Priolo? Thank you. Well, I'm going to close us out today in prayer. Uh, remember, our final session is tomorrow morning, 9, 30, and 11, the main service. Dr. Priolo is going to be preaching um, from a very pertinent passage to tie all of this up and give some much-needed application moving forward. So let's pray and we'll be done. Father, we thank you for your kindness to our church in bringing this dear brother here to minister to us. We thank you for the encouragement. We thank you for the challenge that you've given us from your word. I pray that we wouldn't be hearers of this content and truth but we would be doers and apply it to our lives in the areas where we've been convicted today. 
Lord, I pray for Brother Lou as he continues to minister faithfully at his church in Atlanta, that you would bring about the, the right people, Lord, to come alongside him to facilitate the counseling ministry and give him wisdom and discernment and insight on a potential move of furthering your kingdom and helping with the cause of Christ over in Europe. Pray that you continue to bless him mightily and strengthen him for the task at hand. We thank you for his partnership with us and his encouragement to our church. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow.